Hi, I'm Eleni, and I'll talk today about resistance. Now, in most cases, in our cultures, in our societies, we see resistance as bad, right? We have these ideas that people who resist change either are bad, lazy, don't want change, uh, don't know how to change, can't change. And this makes us um, behave in specific ways. We, we might have a triad that looks like this. Okay, we think that they don't like change. Well, we have to make them do something or we have to affect change. And if we don't, we might fear specific consequences. And so it really directs our, our behavior toward, you know, being kind of pushy or asking for compliance or expecting something without considering people's own experiences. Now, I'd like to invite you to think of resistance in a completely new way, intelligent resistance. Resistance is always intelligence from my point of view, from the human-centric leading point of view, because it questions what do people really need? Well, most people or the re reason people resist change is because they're not convinced that the change is better than what they have. Okay, and they may manifest it in different ways, like they block it off or they say yes, but they don't do it or they do it halfway and they don't really commit to it or they give all the excuses of excuses, et cetera, et cetera. And so when we have this triad toward change or uh, toward resistance, change is always going to be difficult from our point of view, from our experience and the experience of others. Now, if we take this viewpoint, which is human centric, meaning it respects everyone's behavior as intelligent, right? Because we say that in the triad is always logical and therefore if someone is behaving a certain way, meaning resisting, that means it makes sense to them. So we always need to probe and ask why. And in most cases it's because the people are not convinced it's better. That is very smart. Okay, so for this video, we'll look at the triads of these different perspectives. So if we have the current, we, like the current viewpoint that resistance is bad, the triad could be like this. Oh, I as an individual pretend it's my triad if I were thinking this. People don't like change. I have to make them change. If I don't make them change, I have to deal with specific consequences. Maybe my boss will complain about me and consider me incapable of affecting change. I'll want to push and expect and demand like I would be kind of trying to guide people to do something because I fear specific consequences. I have anxiety, I have frustration, and maybe I'm even mad at people who don't change because I think ill of them, right? I think that they can't or they don't want to or they're being stubborn. Okay, that's not a very pleasant experience. Let's try it another way. We use this mindset of saying resistance is intelligent intelligent resistance. I know that when people resist some change, it's because of some concern, even one, a whole set of concerns, depending on the situation, that that person feels like their status quo is better than the change. So they're seeing the change as less than, and that's why they resist it. That makes sense. And that we have to remember that that always makes sense in a triad. Whenever we see a specific behavior, in human-centric leading, we respect that behavior knowing that it's linked to all kinds of thoughts and emotions that keep it in a logical uh, you know, cycle. And so if we resist or reject a specific behavior, we're rejecting a person and their, and their own personhood. We don't wanna do that in human-centric leading. So if I had this, tri uh, this thought, my triad could be like this. Well, I think my edict or my ideas are better than what we have. I can't wait to share them. We can do this. Let's see what other people think. I'm in an experimental mode. I'm open, I'm collaborative. I have a very flexible triad, right? You can feel how much different or how much easier this kind of triad would be than this, right? So you can imagine it when you are the one who is going to ask for change. And you can imagine it also when someone else is being asked by you, like you're, or you're being asked by someone else to change. You'd much rather have someone talk about change in this context than just kind of forcing it down your throat or saying it, uh, saying or assuming that you're, you know, incompetent or something's wrong with you and that's why you're resisting. That, that's not positive. So we always want to use this kind of 
um, a, a triad that's open and curious and experimental and respecting people's resistance. So in the next video, we'll talk about the different triads in its specific examples so you can uh, understand this fully. We're back now. And we will get, uh, use a real life example that we can think of CEO, the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella. And you can read about it in the news anywhere you want. And basically he read a book uh, by Carol Dweck named Mindset. And this book is about the growth and fixed mindsets. And what he did is he was reading them that book apparently for his kids, but then he thought, but that would be great for, for work. So I'm going to implement as a CEO of Microsoft this this idea to the employees at Microsoft. So he came up with, you know, the edict or the request or the suggestion that everyone at Microsoft now become, get into the growth mindset. So let's look in this video about what would make someone resist that idea? Because really growth mindset is what? It's an idea, an assumption that IQ is changeable which it has been proven to be. So in other words, labor economists say, if you educate people, their IQ goes up. If they read a lot of books, IQ goes up. If they practice things, IQ goes up. So IQ is a function of reading, learning, practicing, doing in a, in a sense of you know using your mind and stretching it. So IQ grows. And if you look at IQ levels, you could see from the 1910 to 1950 to 2000, like to 2018 that IQ changes over time. So groups of people can increase in IQ and it's usually through education. So that's what the growth mindset assumes that IQ is flexible and therefore it's like, okay, I could learn anything as long as I practice. I don't expect to know things immediately. I expect to be able to learn it as a function of the input or the, the, the care and input I put. So. You know, if I don't practice and if I don't study, I won't get a lot. That's an assumption in the, in the growth mindset. And so it's, it's really tapping into the natural uh, human sense of learning. People always want to learn and grow. And you can look at another video about basic human needs. It's a basic human need to, to grow and to contribute and to learn. So, you know, it's people are happy and curious and they experiment and they actually practice a lot and they're happy about learning. So learning is a fun experience. So you can imagine how fun this triad would be if we all use it at work, right? It sounds great. So what might the CEO of Microsoft notice or see in resistance? He might find that people are resistant if they're in the fixed mindset. So in this book, you'll read about both mindsets. But basically the fixed mindset assumes that IQ is fixed. We're born with a set of IQ and we happen to be like if I have a high IQ, my family saw that I could learn things easily as a child. I say, good for you. You learn things so easily. You don't even have to practice. So some people learn things like that and they start to identify with that. They start to say, I am this type of learning, meaning I am so smart that I can learn things without even trying. That is a trap. It's fantastic if you, you have it, but it's a trap because it can make you feel like, well, if I have to practice, what does that mean about me? So this fixed mindset actually assumes that if you have to practice, you're not really smart. It assumes that smart people don't have to practice. They can learn things instantaneously and that therefore they're smart. And some people fuse that idea with their identity. So they start to say, I am smart. I learn things quickly. If I don't learn things quickly, that must me mean I'm not smart. I don't want to feel like I'm not smart. So then I won't do anything that I have to practice. You can see how that's a trap. Most things we have to learn how to practice. Uh, musical instruments, learning new languages of any sort, learning really anything requires a lot of practice if you want to master it. So you can imagine how this triad, you know, I'm smart, you know, it's, it identifies with being smart and smart is only I don't have to practice. So you could imagine why people would avoid practicing. It's not because they're stupid. <laughs> it's not because they, they, you know, they, they think they're above practicing or that they, they can't practice. It's really the f assumption that smart equals doing things great. If I have to practice, 
I will feel things I don't want to feel, and therefore I won't do it. And so you can imagine, I don't know if you've ever met people at school or in a workshop you've ever been, where the, the instructor or the professor says, go ahead now, practice this new tool. And then, you know, some are kind of waiting around or, you know, doing other things. They're not actually doing that practice. You can imagine it could be that they worry about not being able to do it immediately or they have done it, you know, in private and they don't want to show the other people there that they weren't able to do it because the private thinking is I'm not good enough, I must not be smart, I don't want anyone to know that I'm not smart because I didn't get this on the first uh, attempt, that's bad, I feel pressured and anxious, I feel fearful of being called not smart, I feel fearful of feeling not smart, it's a trap, you can feel that just by this triad. So let's say 50% of Microsoft have this triad, you, you can't tell people who are, you know, it doesn't mean these people don't love to learn. It means they expect to learn a lot faster than anyone else. So you can imagine how this per type of person might, with this triad, might resist the idea of changing triads, right? Why would they resist it? Well, because they know that. And because they've merged it with their identities and we're not taught to, to learn about our identities, to learn about how separating you know, who we are with what we do, or what we think, or what we feel. And that's one of the whole points of uh, human-centric leading, is to use these triads and to notice that but we're still bigger than these triads. We're outside of the triad, therefore our identities are bigger than what we think, feel, and do, and the results we create. So that's why we look at these triads. That's another reason why we look at these triads in human-centric leading, is to not only make it simple, to see how these patterns happen within us, but also to see that we're bigger than them. We could have this one, we could have that one, we can have millions of others and we can choose. And we can do that by separating. So let's say the Microsoft CEO, just do it. Just become a growth uh, person, use the growth mindset. He could start to think, well, those people must not be as smart. They're resisting this great idea, they must not be smart. If that CEO is assuming that resistance is not, is, is, it means something bad or means that those people don't want to change or can't change. If the CEO starts thinking, you know what, resistance is intelligent. Let me figure out what do these people need to move into the growth mindset. What would make them realize that this mindset is better than that? That would maybe require some workshop, some discussion, maybe not with him specifically, but you get the point that it depends on which triad we are using in the, when we're asking or hoping for change. So this is a very important point because we are so used to demanding change or asking for change but really wanting it and expecting it. It's like a, a hidden expectation for compliance or it's a hidden expectation if this is a freer triad, like everyone who reads it could be, yeah, I'd rather feel curious, happy, and open than pressured, anxious, and fearful. And most people would say that, but getting to it might require something very different. And then someone who's always been this way or has been half this way, half that way, you know? So that means that when people resist and we consider it intelligent, we actually know what we need to do. We can talk about the change and make sure it's clear that people understand how it's better. We can listen to people's resistance and say, why wouldn't you do this? What, what prevents you from doing this? Maybe they don't have the words that are what, what we call speech ready. They can tell why they wouldn't do it if they're in a fixed mindset as an example, but they can't say why they wouldn't do it. So you could ask people, it's like, okay, what, what would happen if you use this mindset or what would happen you know, if you were asked to do something or expected to do something, and then you could start listening to the resistance and then responding to it with empathy and with compassion. And that way you can affect change much more profoundly than demanding it, because this requires compliance. And there are a lot of people in the workforce resist compliance. They don't want to comply anymore. They want to co-create. They want to be part of the decision making. They want to be part of strategies, part of vision, part of the meaning of the work. And so it's a very different workforce and, and mindset. 
So that's why it's important to start looking at resistance as intelligence because then we can work with it and start to see, okay, well maybe I wasn't clear enough in what I was saying because I think the change is fabulous. <laughs> or maybe I don't understand the people who are resisting and what they really need as well as I thought. And I can then you know, adapt myself to see how other people could change. And then if I were the change maker, like on this side, if I was the person being asked to change, I could also dialogue and say, well, this is not better. What if we did this? And really take part of it. So if, imagine if we all sat in a state when we're looking at resistance and how different the, the daily business, day-to-day day -day life and the entire world would be. So if you want to take one takeaway, it's just to notice in yourself, where are you? How do you think about resistance? Do you think it's bad? Do you think it's, it means that somebody, you or other people, uh, don't want change or can't change? Do you resist other people's resistance? Uh, do you judge it? Or are you open and saying, you know, it, it makes sense. Yeah, I only resist things when I think it's worse, worse than what I have, so that makes sense to me. And I'll start assuming it for everyone and then uh, move accordingly.